going to give David a big introduction because he's also winning an award at lunch. Everybody's staying for lunch. We're locking the doors, man. Nobody's leaving. I don't care where you're going. Forget it. Okay? So my friend, um, David's party appeared at more of our conferences than any other one of our national. You know why? Because we're always creating new information. We, we, we do that. And, and that's how we stayed alive. But what a partnership with the top multicultural marketing research company in the country, out of Los Angeles, David Morris. Hi. My work. You guys must be getting sick of seeing me, huh? I thought you could be there somebody. So I'm breaking, uh, is this better? Breaking a couple of uh, rules of market research, never present before lunch, and never follow the theater folk. That's <laughs> a slot that you don't want when you're talking about data. Uh, I, I guess we just missed Dr. Bruce Corey. He, he yeah. had, well, we gave him the love and then he left. He, he deserves a lot of love. He is one of the foremost scholars on uh, the intersection of the African immigrant marketplace with, with, with marketing, and he is also the foremost scholar on the African community here in Minnesota. So uh, anyway, he was a big part of the study. And uh, yeah, you gave him the love that he deserves. Right. So uh, without further ado, here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to start with a video. So we did, the study's a few years old now. I think we did it in 2010. So it's a little dated. But uh, what I'm going to start with is a video. We did focus groups in a bunch of markets, including Minneapolis. and. Uh, Actually, Bruce uh, moderated here in Minneapolis. I moderated some of the groups in Los Angeles. We put together a short video with some clips with uh, folks talking about what it means to be African living here in the United States. And then I'm going to follow it up with, uh, some, some, with, a, with a research report just before lunch that will uh, include uh, not only some information from the focus groups. Can you understand my New Hampshire accent? <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm hearing my, my uh, dropping all my ahs here. And I, I even lived in New Hampshire since the mid-80s. But uh, anyway, and then uh, what we're going to do is, as Rick was talking about, we're going to have a panel. And we've got, uh, we've got some folks here that represent what I consider to be the next generation of Africans living in the United States. So what I'd like to do is open it up to, to Tom Gita uh, and to the panelists and anybody else that wants to comment about what it means to be African in the United States, and uh, one of the key questions is going to be for your generation, folks that have been born here, uh, or folks that came here at a young age, what does it mean to be African? And you'll see, uh, I left out a lot of the marketing slides, you know, where do you shop and all of that. This, uh, I'm going to talk a lot about kind of African identity, and what it means, and what, what are some of the challenges of being African and living in the United States? What, why did you come here? Why did your parents come here? So um, let's, uh, let's go to the video first, and then I'll show you some data. I'm from Cameroon, and I've been here since 2003. Uh, West Africa. I've been here for nine years. Uh, about 17 years. Uh, West Africa and Senegal. Uh, about 12 years now. The biggest challenge is, is like the food, you know, the food type in America. This is a very beautiful country. But one of the worst things about this country is the food. The language and learning the, the culture and uh, being able to, to, to work and try to make a living. I didn't quite fit in with Africans, but I didn't quite fit in with American. I was just kind of in the middle for a long time. They started, uh, you know, when we were younger, back in the 90s, like to tease African students, they would always call you African booty scratcher. I don't know where it came from, some sort of Discovery Channel something, and I don't even know, but it was like the term, like it's just what you called African students. I miss my family, that was my biggest challenge. My first time really questioning my Africanhood was when I went to school here at um, UCSB. Reason being was, I stayed in the African American hall, the black hall, so to speak, because I wanted to connect with others, who were such as myself and who had interesting stories to tell, you know? 
Um, come to find out, I wasn't really black American. I was African. Why? Because there was something that just, there was like an invisible shield between myself and those other black students who grew up in this country. And that's when I really learned to see myself as an African more and more every single day that passed on. I feel like I'm from the motherland, you know. You know, every now and then, every now and then you gotta throw in, you know, especially, you know, being Nigerian. I'm Nigerian, you know, and it's like, and when I say it, I say what a proudness, because I am. I'm proud to, to be a Nigerian and the things that we represent, the culture, everything. Family values, how you treat elders, you know, respect, yeah. you know, if there's a, what a wedding means, you know, just what family means. It's about the respect, and I call respect differently. Everybody have a different ways of calling respect. The way you approach people, the way you talk to them is all different, and sometimes you won't know what it is until you're dealing with it. You know, the way you're dealing with people, you know I should give this person a respect and they gave it to me back. They show nothing but negative stuff. If I didn't know better, I wouldn't believe that's this place I come from. You, have, you hardly ever see nothing positive about Africa. The only thing they do positive about Africa is when they show the animals in the game parks. As there's some bias, some negativity, because for me, you won't watch the news and learn a lot about it in Africa. You have to go there. The news will just tell you what they want you to see and know. Very narrow. I always find myself turning to people where they'll do like a piece on AIDS in Africa and they'll show like, you know, barefoot children running, you know, and, and it's like, okay, yeah, there's poverty and like there's a lot, most people don't have shoes, but their schools, mm -hmm. their, you know, it's, it's hot. So yeah, yeah, it's okay to walk without shoes, you know? It's not like here where you have hard roads and, and where everyone's clothes are mended, but um, they portray it as if it's like really backwater, you know, yeah. where mm -hmm. everyone is starving, mm -hmm. where everyone is dying of AIDS. <laughs> it's offensive. <laughs> <laughs> This country gave us the opportunity that other country, our own country did not give us, no friends did give us. Uh, so we do appreciate being here. The land of opportunity, you asked me that question. It is, um, it is a land of opportunity. And it is a freedom out here. It's a fantastic place. It's been good to me and I think it's a nice, it's a fantastic place. And I think it is the most blessed nation on the face of the earth. The people who live here and who own this country, the people to whom this country belongs, they are really blessed people, my friend. Pretty, pretty cool folks in the video, huh? Thank you. Yeah, and, and as Rick was saying, uh, the very, very little work is done on the African, what's called the African Im immigrant segment. In fact, I really believe that this was the first study, certainly a marketing study that was ever done, and I have been contacted by so many people since we did this study, scholars, uh, as well as people in the marketing area, people, people in broadcasting. Uh, there's been so much interest in this study, and to my knowledge, I don't think a study of this scope has yet to be done. So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, what, what, what we found in the study, and then we'll get to the panel. So, oh, actually, I've, I can let me turn the slides with this. So first of all, why did, why did the folks that we talked to come to the United States in the first place? And I'm going to show you some quantitative data in a second. Uh, I think what we're going to find here is that the African market is not a monolithic market. Uh, people came for many different reasons, and we're gonna see some, some geographic diversity in terms of differences in terms of where people live in the U.S. as well as countries of origin. Uh, certainly some came here uh, on, on scholarship. You know, some came with their spouses. Uh, you know, contrary to the perceptions that seem to be projected on some of, of, of these folks, many of the people that came here were from, were well-to-do. 
uh, that had the means to come here in the first place, and many also uh, went to other countries prior to coming to the United States. We heard a lot about France, we heard a lot about England, we heard a lot about Canada, and uh, you know, many, many, many uh, came here to the United States for opportunities, to, to go to school, to work, but a lot of them talked about you know, wanting to go back to Africa after living here for a bunch of years, and, and uh, you know, whether it be to, to reunite the family or, or, or to help their communities. Now you can see here, now uh, a little market research 101, when you see those letters there, you know, the B and D, that means that it's significantly higher than some of those other columns. And you can see, comparing four markets, Los Angeles, New York, Washington, D.C., and Minneapolis, uh, you can see big, why is that ringing? Right? You can see big differences in terms of why folks came here. For instance, in Los Angeles, where we have a, a, a large Kenyan population, uh, a lot of folks, 45% uh, came here to go to school. 40, whereas if you look at New York, uh, the number one answer was opening a business. 28% came here. D.C., again, going a variety of reasons. Let's look at Minneapolis. 49%, uh, so about half of the Africans that we interviewed that came to Minneapolis, came to, they were sponsored. Uh, they came uh, to be reunited uh, with family members. Some of that's going to reflect the, the large Somalian population that you have here. Some folks were refugees. Let me clarify, too, we spoke to Sub-Saharan Sub -Saharan Africans. So in essence, this, we excluded folks from Northwestern Africa that might be considered uh, of Arab origin as opposed to, to, to African origin. And you can see uh, some differences, too, by the, in terms of the region uh, in Africa where folks came from. So we talked about uh, what, 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 were their, what were your challenges when you came to the United States. Uh, Heard a lot about culture shock, not surprisingly. Language, uh, figuring out the American system, how do things work over here? Home, so a lot of these things are things that we generally hear from, from immigrants, but there were, there were some other things too, which we'll get into a little bit in a minute or two. Uh, racism, we'll hear about that. Lack of respect in the community, and part of this is, is a result of these, these, uh, these, these stereotypes that, that we're gonna hear about. Holding on to tradition, traditions, maintaining these African traditions, passing these traditions on to, to the kids. Uh, that came up a lot as well. And, uh, and, and, and certainly racism. Um, now, what we did hear a lot about is pride. Pride in being from Africa. And uh, we asked, you know, what does that mean? What does it mean to you? to be African? What are, what are some of these cultural values that you're, that you're most proud of? Respect, you know? especially for elders. Uh, respect for oneself, a, a strong sense of discipline. Heard a lot of people say, you know, we're, we're happy people. We're, we're polite, we, we meet, we, we, we take pride in our, in our appearance. Uh, hospitality. You know, somebody somebody comes to your house and you, you offer them tea, you, you make them feel at home. That's what it means to be African. Religion. Be you be you Muslim, be you Christian. Uh, heard a lot about religion being a, a, a pillar of, of what it means to be to, to be African. A strong work ethic, focus on education, uh, being receptive to other cultures, to to, to other other ways of being. Uh, raising kids with a, a strong African identity, valuing family and, and roots, and, 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 and kind of a, a familial, I call it dependency. I mean, one of the things we, we, we encounter in our multicultural research, you know, one of the pillars, I think, of being, being an American, one of the things that we really value as Americans is individuality. You know, we're, we're, we're an individualistic society, and we're raised to value that. Whereas in other cultures, and, 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 and Africa being one, uh, the emphasis is more on interdependence. And there's a real pride that, you know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm an independent person. I'm, I'm pursuing my dreams, but I, I also am very connected to, to others, to my family, to my, to my parents, to my grandparents. We heard a lot about altruism. 
you know, that, that to be African means to, to give back, to help others. And, uh, you know, we certainly heard a lot about music and, and food. Um, so we, uh, am I going the wrong way again? So, um, you know, we did hear, and, and, and when you don't see numbers, this is largely from the qualitative research, that it's really a challenge uh, to stay connected to one's African culture. And, uh, you know, you can do it through music, you can do it through food, you can do it through community, uh, but that's one of the things that, uh, that people are really struggling with here in the United States. And, and, and particularly, and we're going to hear from our panel in a couple of minutes, but how do you pass these pretty sacred values onto that next generation that's being, being raised here in the United States? Um, when am I going to get... So racism, um, racism came in a bunch of different forms. I mean, let's face it, uh, you know, there have been a lot of studies that show uh, that it, it's not easy to be black living in the United States, and that racism is, it, it is something that we, that, uh, you know, that has been bequeathed to us from our past, and it, it is certainly something that we heard a lot about talking to these folks. We also heard, and it, it's kind of a controversial thing to talk about, and I took some heat from some African-American friends talking about this, because, you know, there, 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 there is a, a desire, I think, to be united as a black community. But some folks did talk about discrimination from other from African Americans and, and the reason that they gave was you know we just we, we come from a different culture. We talk differently. We we and, and, and you heard that young man talking about the difficulties that he had living in the African American or what he called the black dormitory that he just felt like he didn't fit in. We heard a lot of that, you know, difficulty in fitting in. So um, we ask, you know, um, how are, you know, agree, disagree? 62% felt that Africans are portrayed negatively in, in the U.S. media. Uh, and yet, you know, on the positive side, 59% uh, felt that, uh, you know, their, 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 their education skills and talents are, in fact, valued in the workplace. And, you know, 31% said that they experienced racism. I actually felt that that was kind of a low a low number, given especially what we heard in the qualitative. It was a very, very salient theme in, in, in the focus groups that we had done. Um, you know, people, we, we asked what, it's, what, what is it like to live in the United States? How do you feel about life here in the United States? And we heard, we heard criticism. And, and, you know, I mean, let me say, whenever you talk to any immigrant segment or any, any segment, uh, you know, you're going to hear critiques. Uh, some felt that uh, we're kind of American-centric. <laughs> we don't have, you know, and I think a lot of that has to come with, we, we, we don't really receive a firm grounding in, in African history and African geography. Uh, uh, international reputation has gone down. I remember this study was a few years old, too. Children are not taught discipline. We hear that from many cultures. But, you know, let's talk, let, let, let's look at the other side. Still the land of opportunity here. We heard that. Uh, you know, it's a great place to, to, to form a, a circle of friends that's diverse and from whom you can learn about their culture and what's important to them. Um, you have the freedom in, in, in the United States to do what you want to do and to become who you want to be. And I think in many ways that's what attracted many of these immigrant folks in the first place was they felt that the United States offered opportunities that simply were not available to them in Africa. Uh, you know, the educational system, again, we saw a lot of folks came here to study. And, uh, you know, let's face it, you, you, you know, we are a democracy and you have the opportunity to vote and uh, to, to, to voice your opinion without being, being persecuted. So uh, African or African American, we asked, you know, to what extent, uh, uh, how do you identify, how do you uh, feel about, are, are you African or are you African American? And what we really heard was we are, we are we're black, but we're African. We are African. And uh, their identity, they felt, was 
very situationally dependent. Um, for instance, uh, they, many said, you know, you know, when I'm the only African in a group, be that with a group of white folks or a group of African American folks. You know, in many situations, I'm the only African in the group, and I'm probably dealing with a group of people that just aren't that familiar with what it means to be uh, African. Um, and yet, you know, a, a big theme was this respect for the United States uh, and uh, the opportunities that it offers. Now, one of the things that I'm going to be very interested in hearing from our panel is, well, let me talk for a minute about a study that was done about 10 years ago. It was a Harvard scholar named Mary Waters. And she looked at, uh, she looked at immigrants from, black immigrants from the West Indies. And what sh she found was that um, immigrants from the West Indies, black immigrants from the West Indies, had a very strong West Indian, you know, be it Jamaican or whatever they were from, identification, but that that was lost to a certain extent in the, by the second generation and certainly the third generation, that there was kind of an assimilation to, towards an African-American identity. Uh, and we certainly heard from these folks that one of their concerns is passing on an African identity and, and the values that they consider to be African onto their kids. So I think it's going to be very interesting, and Tom is going to get into that with the panelists, I think, to, to, to find out, you know, to what extent, uh, you know, what does it mean to, to, to grow up in this country and be a person of, you know, recent African descent? We asked, what do you enjoy doing? And I think, the I mean, just look at the diversity, you know, uh, of, of what everything from parks, <laughs> national parks, and I think state parks would probably, you know, and lakes in the summertime. Again, we, you know, we did do the interviews in Minneapolis. But, uh, you know, everything from the World Series, uh, American football, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, you know, heard lots about religion. Um, Especially from the Muslims, and again, remember this was done a few years ago, but they talked about, you know, it's kind of difficult to, to, to pray here in the United States. You might get some dirty looks from folks, uh, you know, it's just, but, uh, you know, Muslim or Christian, you know, they talked about uh, wanting their children to receive a spiritual, religious upbringing and to be good, good Muslims or good Christians. Um, so some of the challenges, you know, how important, very important to stay connected with family and friends in, in, in one's native country, 87% said that, so again, there's, uh, at least with that first generation, uh, there's that strong desire to stay connected to Africa, to the home, to the motherland, but also to, to family and friends, um, keeping the traditions alive, and, and be that you know, the food, the music from, from culture, but also, you know, 74% said the traditions, the values. Um, a little bit down in terms of the numbers, but still important, 70% uh, wanted their kids to speak, you know, the, 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 the language of, 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 the, of the motherland, whatever that might be. Uh, of 65% said observing traditional religious events was important. And uh, you know, half said it was important uh, for their kids uh, to marry other, other Africans, or, or should I say people from the same culture, maybe the same country. Um, we asked what success means to you. And they talked a lot about financial success, but we heard a lot about personal success too. Finding out who you are, uh, being confident in what you do, having a good job, raising your family, just enjoying life. We heard a lot about sort of non-material uh, aspirations. And again, keep in mind that a big percentage of these folks came to the United States for, you know, for economic or, or, or educational reasons. Um, again, not happy with the way Africans are... We heard Tarzan <laughs> mention many, many times and that's, that's kind of the image that certainly they feel by which their Africans are projected. And, you know, we heard a lot about AIDS. 
heard a lot about starving babies and things like that. And, and you know, what we heard was, well, yeah, yeah, we, we got that. We got that. But, you know, what, what I don't see is the other side. You know, what, what, I, what I don't see portrayed in the media is the, is the Africa that I love, the Africa that I miss, the Africa that I want my kids to know. And um, I think um, I think this might be the light, last slide, but we, we, we did ask a lot of uh, shopping questions. I, I think the, the interesting thing here is media, and uh, in terms of uh, which language do you prefer your media in, or this, is, this is in terms of consumption of media. And what you see is you know overwhelmingly consuming English language media, but still I think it's important. Uh, there's not a whole lot. Uh, Michelle being a, a notable uh, example of in the, well actually Michelle is in, 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 in English as well uh, but uh, you know still a desire to see language that is in one's own language one's native language but you know overwhelmingly uh, you can see um, English one of the I think one of the slides I took out was uh, was it we asked what, what what is it that you're consuming in terms of media, I took it out because it's dated, but uh, you know, we saw a lot of you know CNN and news news channels and public television and things like that. Uh, very. I mean, let, let me just say uh, on a closing note, I was so inspired by listening to these folks. You know, I, I, you know, I think we we all have in the United States uh, an ethos of of immigrants coming to, to make the country better. And I, I just really felt all warm and fuzzy inside after doing this research. Like, uh, you know, this was an amazing group of people. So that's all. I'm, if, if you'd like a copy of this, my, my email is david at newamericandimensions.com. Shoot me an email. I'll send you the deck. Just keep in mind it is a little bit, you know, a little bit dated. And uh, what I think we might want to do now is ask our panelists to have, I mean, we pull, pull, pull some seats up here, and let's let's uh, open this up. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Tom Gitan, and, and Tom is the, the publisher of Mashali. He's the man in town. You know, you want to reach the community, go to Tom, and Mohammed's here, and I'm going to let you introduce your people here. All right, uh, thank you, Rick. Uh, let, let me introduce the panel in the interest of time. Um, I'll start at the extreme left. Uh, should we? Well, uh, should you want, you guys want to do it by yourself, or can I, can I do it? Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. So Issa Mansour is also a publisher. Uh, he publishes uh, the Africa paper. Uh, it's mostly online. Uh, uh, for those who are familiar with MinPost, if you're familiar with MinPost, so uh, more in-depth news, you know, analysis, features, deep, deep, deep stuff. Uh, the Africa paper does that kind of deep stuff uh, online. Uh, they have correspondents around the country and globally, actually. So, whereas as we're more of a general news, Michelle is more of a general news uh, uh, organization, they, they are more into the deep stuff. Uh, if you want to, you know, uh, connect at a deeper level with the African readers, that's that's him. And then uh, he and he and is uh, is a systems engineer, a systems engineer in town here. Uh, he's of Kenyan origin. Came here when he was uh, seven years old. Uh, so his parents basically are the people you, that uh, David was talking up here about uh, that came here for opportunity, education, and, and uh, you know, he and was raised here as a, as a result of that uh, uh, time, you know, chance to come here for, uh, for opportunity. And then there's um, Amy Diba. Amy Diba's uh, parents uh, from the Gambia. She was born here. Uh, so she's a second generation, uh, and you know we'll get some perspective from her on about uh, you know what it is to be a second generation uh, African in, uh, in Minnesota or the U.S. And then we have Mohammed Kali. Uh, you, Rick, already introduced him. Uh, he runs the Somali radio, the first Somali radio station, I believe, in the United States. As far as I know, you know we keep records of these things. Uh, we, we are the basically the news the newspaper of record. So we I know for a fact is the first Somali uh, FM radio station. Yeah, can I say something? Yeah. About, I I know. Um, okay, go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, you know, by the way, we're the neighbor in Africa. So sometimes when we hit African, are you African or am I African? We Somali and Kenya, we neighbor. So 
that question will be talked today. But let me say this. I'm the one of the people from Rivichi 22 years ago, this country. And, uh, and the question I ask every day myself is, when my country have a civil war, we Rivichi in Kenya, and we get opportunity, Lutheran Family Service, response our family, we come to North Carolina. And then when we come to North Carolina, that's why I went to school, show university, and I play football. I come champion, and I know play American football, but somehow I come champion. So, so the question I ask is, then we find Minnesota is the best place to live, and I, we have the large Somali community in the state of Minnesota. And, and by the way, we're the neighbor in Somalia, and now we are Minnesota, and now we Africa. We can keep that name together. So, this is the first Somali FM radio, and uh, and United States, and this is the voice we have, and I'm happy to be here today and keep doing. Thank you, Mama. Okay, so since I know all of your marketers, you're interested in uh, in the market. So let's ask our panelists. Uh, especially, I'm interested in the two young uh, immigrants. You know, why don't we start with them first? They can tell us if what they actually saw, David, uh, produ uh, you know, uh, presenting here. How does that does that that make did that make any sense to you? You know, just looking at your parents and yourself now. Did you see anything that resonates with you or different from what you saw? Why don't you start with you, Amy? Thank you for having us today. Um, well, I think for myself watching it, it was very unique because um, I am the only one in my household that was born here. I have one brother. He was born in Gambia. He came here when he was 10. My mother and my father were born in Gambia, so I have a very unique experience in my household. Um, but, you know, we live in a four-bedroom home, and I can, and like I said, it's four of us, my mother and father in one room. But most of my life, I was never in my room by myself because we always had family over, someone moving into the country, needed somewhere to start off. And so I very much relate to that experience. And um, going to what he was talking about as far as the... African American experience and the African experience, I understand that because I very much feel like I understand both perspectives because I didn't have a Gambian friend or an African friend until I was 16. And so all of my friends were African American and I didn't know the difference. I, I'm black, you know. So I very much identify with what I saw in that video. Same thing here. All right. Um... My parents uh, moved here when I was six years old, and six, seven, just around the border there. And my experience is a little bit different um, in the sense that I grew around a big community. I had a lot of, a lot of Kenyans around me. I'm from Kenya. Um, I have a younger brother as well who's a year younger than I am. So my experience is a little bit different in the sense that I identify or I was able to identify from a very young age and being born in Kenya, um, I was able to identify with a lot of what that means to be African. Um, a lot of people growing up like would look at people that have hijabs on and they're like, oh, but I'm like, what do you mean? Like, you know, like I, I grew up in an environment where that was just the norm. So a lot of these things, a lot of things that even friends of mine that were African American would question, um, I would look at them like, nah. I really don't necessarily agree with that, or I don't identify with that. So um, I do have a very strong uh, African uh, identity in me, but I'm, I'm also very uh, involved in the African American community. Um, I am actually in the uh, NAACP uh, Economic Development uh, Committee, so I'm very involved in that sense. So I do have an identity that extends that African identity, and I think when it comes to market research, um, our generation, the generation that we're coming from, is very consumer. We consume a lot. We consume a lot very quickly and very fast. So I do identify with that. I thought it was very funny, the African booty, booty scratcher thing. I dealt with that in school. Um, but it's very interesting because right now there's a, lot of, there's a lot of a turnaround now where, <clears throat> where a lot of African Americans really want to be identifying with, uh, with their African roots. Um, a lot of clothing lines around the Twin Cities and elsewhere that are really doing well, um, and African Americans are the major consumers of this, and it's 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 somebody that's African that's creating it. So um, I, I I did identify with a lot of what we saw. Uh, I have a, a a bit of a different experience, so I I see the this perspective, but I also have a different experience, and I think that um, that social media has really changed a lot of what we see, and we might be able to get into that in a little bit. But uh, that's my little piece. 
So Isa, uh, Isa, why don't you take it uh, to the media side? Remember, one of the slides was talking about the negative portrayal of Africans uh, in American media. And you now being a business person and you actually have a, a media platform to, uh, to deal with that. How, you, how is that playing out for you and kind of what are the other, how is the market receiving your, your publication? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> I remember when I first came to the U.S., I was, I got the scholarship, uh, they accepted me once, then I refused to come, then the second time they accepted me, then I was back here uh, at Columbia University. Then I also did my undergrad at Webster. So the first thing was, uh, I realized at Webster I was the only African in the class. So then I went to Columbia, they gave us an assignment, and, uh, and a colleague was saying, well, you have an accent. Then I turned and I said, how many languages do you speak? He said, well, only English. I said, well, I speak uh, five, including German. I said, OK. So leaving that school, and uh, work, I went back to Vienna, where I was at the uh, International Press Institute as an African researcher. So I traveled to some of the country to research on press freedom, what is happening to African journalists, who is killed, what are the policies. Then I left, I came back, I decided to settle back in Minneapolis. So one thing I realized that uh, there are hidden professionals. What I mean by this, there are so many professional African journalists in the States, including Minnesota. Some have covered wars for Reuters and AP, some worked for the BBC, some worked for the Associated Press, um, some worked for, for so many newspapers. But the point is that penetrating into the mainstream media is a problem. I went to school with colleagues who are in these states. Some of them are editors for Star Tribune, Pioneer Press. So, but yesterday, I read an article where somebody was complaining that the Africa people wrote a story, but we never quoted the police. But the guy never returned to us or even called to ask how, what happened. Not knowing that the backstory was, we sent a letter and email to the police department to give us an interview. They said, oh, it's under investigation. So we interviewed somebody else. So but I never went back to say, hey, you do not do your work. Do you are working for a media uh, uh, organization. But coming back to it is that if only all of us here, professionals working in the market, you try to identify who are these guys? Who are the professionals? Where can we get professional African journalists? it would be a tremendous boost because we understand our community. I was surprised when I received an email from Deborah at one, at one, time, at one time inviting us. I asked the question, how do you know about us? Because we never come out to talk about what we are doing. We do more deeper stories, investigative stories, but we syndicate our stories to Star Tribune, uh, sorry, to uh, Min, uh, Spokesman Recorder, The Twin, Daily Planet, and other newspapers, New African and Out. So, because we cannot get into that market. But the point is, now that we are growing, people started to know the Africa paper, so we started to branch out to get the audience. And what we have been telling people is that the main stories that the newspapers are covering here, we can cover them too. And guess what happened? Early this year, we got the Martin Luther King Award. I was also in Chicago doing on community and gun violence to create an institute in the Midwest. Then I was back in New York to do entrepreneurial journalism. I said, so if only we can look at that, then the market will be able to understand who are these guys, how do they deliver this story, and what are the sources that you have that you think the mainstream media don't have. Mm -hmm. So this is where we are going, and we think we can relay more into our own markets, because for almost previous years, we have been trying to do the Africa paper barbecue, where we invite people uh, leaders, market, uh, and organization just to interact. We invited some of our colleagues, coming back to your question, we invited the mainstream media and some of our friends to show up in our barbecue, free food. They never showed up or even emailed us. So, but we are not despairing, or we are not um, uh, devastated by that. We think we can do the same job as they are, only that the market is not open to understanding us. 
and we do not know where to meet them. That is the problem with most of the professional African journalists. So when we received the email from Deborah asking us to come to the table to talk, we were surprised. Say, so, well, you are the first, but others are also sitting back. So our main issue is to cover these communities in depth to understand their stories, because if you have major stories in the community, some of our people are not open to talking to others. They are shy. The women, for example, the first time I went to cover the Somali community with the camera, they said, oh, no, we are not going to. But when I told them, oh, I'm also from Africa, they said, OK, now you can stay. So these are the ways we are able to penetrate. I don't want to take much of the discussion, but uh, we'll get back to that. So, so Mohammed, um, tell us uh, some of the, you know, I know you need underwriting, for example, for your station. Because uh, part of the challenge, I think, we, that uh, African media faces, local African media here, that was talked about actually by Rico. Is Rico still, is Rico still here? Yeah, because remember how he talked about when he was doing his presentation that, you know, uh, you go to some of the print, African print newspapers, and the reporters have all left. Well, that, that one we're actually talking about is a capacity of funding and advertising dollars, and, uh, you know, how do we actually develop these uh, media outlets so they can provide that partnership that marketers are looking for. So, Ali, because your station just launched, I actually want you to take just a minute because uh, I see Rick is giving me the eye there. I know lunch is almost coming. So, yes, yes, I, I, I really want to, because this is really special because. I need a pair of binoculars. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because I, I, I kind of want him to kind of just talk briefly some of the challenges or opportunities that are faced with the, you know, with this new radio station that is in town. Uh, you know, I, I, we need money to go in there. That's right. I mean, when we're talking about marketing, we said, do they understand how we do marketing? And, and you have to understand one thing, this radio, what we do is we connect the whole community. When we're talking about education, when we're talking about the help, when we're talking about the youth, this government violence, we bring in the parents, 10 parents, 20 parents, to talk about why their kid is going. And the community questioned that parents, and we learned from a lesson for the first hand. When we talk about education, why our kid is failing, we ask a lot of parents their kid is failing. We ask them why it's failing. They don't sleep good time, they don't eat good food. Uh, it's a lot of challenge. They want to help education, they want to help health, they want to help the violence, but they don't understand the culture, they don't understand the religion. Like he said, we're from Africa, but sometimes the way we approach each other is different also. Mm -hmm. So that is uh, that is who can build a bridge, who understand what everybody's going to. This radio, it's not radio, it's a saving life. When the President of the United States come to Minnesota and he single out our community, we have to respond. We have to tell them, look, we know that 20 people. We have 120, 150,000 Somali live in this great country. Mm -hmm. We can bring our own record. We have a billion dollar. We are entrepreneur. We have our hundred hundred businesses. Some of our kids go in the higher university in the United States. We elected the first city council. We elected school school board. We elected the legislator. We will elected the Congress and Senate. We are hundred percent sure. So we want to be a people understand and ask you the question. And especially, I love what you write together. But always we said, your history. You have to write your history so more people know you. Thank you. So, um, one question I have for Amy. Yes. Okay. So, Amy, I know is uh, as you, you know I know you you kind of also like here and here you kind of straddle you know that uh, general market or African American uh, circle and then you also in the African. So, what can you tell so all these people you see are all these are marketers. So when they when they are trying to tell you something, will you respond better if uh, it's tailored to you as an African immigrant, African American, or what? What, what do you make of all what you've seen here this morning? Because you, you've been here all day. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it depends on what you're trying to sell. You know, um, I see the slides a lot, and you see African American, and everyone is lumped into one sum. Um, there are different ages, different cultures, different backgrounds, whether you're African-American, whether you're African, Africa's huge, black people are not the same. Um, so I think it really depends on putting the money behind the research to find out who it is that you're actually marketing to. 
because a lot of dollars are being wasted otherwise. Um, other than that, we need to be part of our narrative. I, I want to be part of the person telling my story. And so if you exclude me, um, if you just take a picture of me and put it in a pamphlet, I appreciate seeing myself. However, I would like to be a part of that story as well. Um, so in essence, I want to be welcomed. But how do you welcome me to something that I should already, already be a part of? If it's mine as well, I need, to be, I need to feel like I own a part of it and not that I'm being welcomed to someone else's party. Mm. That is the essence of what I would like to see in marketing. Um, I went to school for marketing and mass communications in my undergrad program, and I studied television management in my uh, master's program. And I went to class and saw some of my peers who didn't do anything, didn't come to class. And you go on LinkedIn and they're working for Disney. You're like, okay, well, I went to class every day. And sometimes you feel like, you know, it's because I'm not being asked to be part of this conversation. I, I don't feel like I have a place at the table. And so it becomes a challenge. So I know maybe sometimes we, uh, we look to these resources of LinkedIn or posting jobs on, um, different, in different places. But a lot of the time, we get filtered out of being able to even have a conversation. We get filtered out of a position because, you know, this person may not have the experience. Well, when will we get the experience if no one gives me the opportunity to speak for myself? So that is what I would like to share with you all because I know that you're here for a reason because you do want to know, and I hope that you heard me. <laughs> I think it's a very good question. Uh, personally, I believe that when it comes to marketing, um, we the word of mouth is still, and it will always be until the end of time, the best way to get word, the word out to people. Um, my, my generation specifically, I'm going to just ask a quick question for everybody. When you woke up this morning, within the first 40 minutes, how many of you got on social media? Okay. Now, how many of you is that a norm? This is what you do every single day. Okay. If we weren't in a room with marketing folks, that number would be decreased. My generation, our generation, we wake up and the first thing we're looking for is our phone. Um, the first thing that we're doing is this. Now, I'll give you a personal market study, and I know this is how it functions for us. Um, a good friend of mine uh, is is a, is a workout phenom, awesome athlete, et cetera, et cetera. I could go on forever. Now, she was invited to uh, to take part in a in a in a photo shoot for a company that specifically deals with um, with with African clothing. Uh, she took place in it, it was athletic wear. She took place in it, um, she posted a picture on, on, I think it was Instagram or Facebook or something. And I went on and I was like, oh, well, what is this? And I was, I, I, so I clicked on it. And now I own clothes from that particular, from that particular brand because she was allowed to come out and show her talents. And this wasn't something that she's not good at. This isn't something that she doesn't already do. I trust her as an individual. So for me, the best way that we can market is exactly like you said, to get people at the table, at the table that they belong to be at, right? She's, 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 she does athletic work. So why should she not be invited to do a shoot if your company deals with athletics, right? If somebody is a, is a hiker, if somebody is an athlete. Um, I know we have some people here from, uh, from Parks and Parks and, uh, it wasn't Parks and Recreation. Yeah. yeah. So, so we have those individuals here. So how can we get those people to come to the table and not just be part of the photo shoot, but also be part of this is what we do and this is who we are. So me, I'm looking on Facebook because this is what we do. My generation consumes, I said this already, consumes a large amount of information very quickly. And we're very, we, we become very good at filtering through the BS. We can filter through it very quickly. So, because we don't have time. It's next, 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 next. So, because we're able to do that, we see when it's authentic. So I know that this clothing line is real because she says so, right? Because Amy is the one that posts about it, I know. 
So I can then go to this and, and, and purchase from this, or I can then go to the park, or I can then go to, uh, to go play tennis, say, you know, USTA, whatever it might happen to be. So the word of mouth is still the best way to get the word out there as far as marketing goes. Everybody in here probably already knows that. And the word of mouth now is starting to become through different channels. And as long as we're at the table, my generation is going to post about it. When we do good things, we want people to know. You know, our social media is a highlight reel. So when there's good things going on, we want people to know, and um, the best way to do that is to have us at the table. We're gonna share about it, and um, there'll be there'll be uh, traction. Say something about that. Oh, yeah, about, about the marketing. Yeah. Uh, really, when we look for the uh, the marketing, is most of the time, um, like he said, the trust. Trust need time. People, if they don't know you, they're not gonna trust you. And sometimes what we do is. We can reach East African, especially the Somali community. A lot of people want to send the message to Somali community. And what what we do here is, we know everybody's listening to the radio. And a lot of people senior, they don't, they live different world. They live alone right now. And the only thing they have is radio. Especially the doctor, when, when you see the doctor always tell you watch the TV or listen to the radio because when you're alone home, and you don't understand the language, still you're going through the same problem. So now we find our own solution. Everybody have their own little radio, they can buy $20, and they have a neighbor. They know what's happening in Minnesota, they know if the weather is bad, they don't need to go and wait bus for 10 minutes and you're gonna die, or the weather is too hot. So now, this is not chasing money, this is saving life. And, and what we look here, is sometimes a lot of people come, they say, oh, we need uh, underwriting, we need to make some announcement for us. And when we look how much they give us, and the same time we see the other radio, what they give, we say, wow, these people, you know, this is how they do business. We know how the, everything works, because you can look for their budget, they can look how they reach everybody. And sometimes when we see, like, and, and, and this is what, I, what we learned, they said, if you have an accent, it's hard to convince someone don't speak your language, you know? So I hope, uh, I hope and we can um, broke that bridge and we can build a great bridge to communicate and have a better state and better city. Okay, Rick, one quick. I, I want Isa to just chip in quickly because I saw, I saw you nodding his hand. Okay, uh, about the undervaluing, uh, quickly, 30 seconds, the undervaluing of uh, African uh, media um, and, and the like, you know, kind of uh, the uh, market is devaluing African media by not giving the proper placements. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, that is true. The, the placements of adverts, the placements of uh, even sponsored content is not really uh, coming to the size of the African media. Because somebody said it earlier this morning, I think it was Biko, that we are, uh, uh, there is content, but there are no journalists. So that is happening. And the other thing is, mind you, our own community sometimes, even when we have events, just imagine somebody will call me early in the morning, seven o'clock, say, oh, we have an occasion this morning, 10 o'clock, are you coming? I have to be there. So that is how we respond. They don't send you a press release, they don't tell you, oh, we're going to have it in two weeks. They will call you in the late midnight, 12 o'clock, say, hey, tomorrow we have a, a party in the evening, are you coming? <laughs> Yesterday somebody come, oh, on Saturday, Sunday, we have an occasion, are you coming? So this is how the market should also respond. If they are calling you, say, oh, well, you should have told us. But if you want to market, go where they are. Mm -hmm. I know most of the parties where they are happening, the Sierra Union party, the Gambia party. Who has ever visited an African party to see what these people are doing? Why is the occasion? We always have both rights. We also have, instead of here, they call them picnic, we call them outing. When they tell you outing, that means my son, my children, my wife, everybody, we are going somewhere to cook and eat. So that is how we call our own picnics. So you have to reach out and you respond when they respond because you want to market something. So if they say, hey, 10 o'clock in the morning, we have something, please show up, you see. So, but we understand that and that is how we are able to get our stories and we are always there. We don't leave a story behind, we follow it. For example, we have been on one story for almost three years because now the source is like every time, hey, we are going to have a memorial, we show up. Sometimes I say, oh, it's too late, but I'm coming. So not only because we want to follow the story, but because we have built the trust. And once the trust is there, 
If you are following the African media, you know where they are going, how they are getting their stories, and what is the difference with the mainstream. The mainstream doesn't have the patience to stay on one story for three years. Mm -hmm. But we show up when they call us and say, okay, I'm coming. So that is where the market is. They call you tonight, you show up tomorrow morning. Okay. Right. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Okay, so Rick is standing up, so thank you so much. That's the <laughs>